Meow. Who pulls cat? And Becky the Terrier presents. Never mind the sounds in the background. It's Mr. Bear eating empty bowls of food. I just want to talk about two research reports that are a little dated now, from early February. This one on pediatrics and COVID-19 disease, and this one about lessons from Wuhan from the initial outbreak. I think they're actually well, well worth looking at. Both of these were highly influential in various ways, and both of them are somewhat responsible for the absolute certainty some people under the age of 60 have that they're not going to die from COVID-19. This one in the Pediatric Analyst by Hageman uh, as an editorial, and it's basically amusing now because of the uh, list of stuff they're doing to protect America. Didn't work. Anyway, um, so they looked at China with just over 80,000 cases and with just under 3,000 deaths at the time. And out of those 80,000 cases, they found that under the age of 19, there were 965 cases. So if you figure that out, one for every 80 cases of COVID-19 disease will be under the age of 19. And more interestingly, half of those 416, so one in 160 cases was actually under the age of 10. And they did find infants under the age of one. They did point out the infants seem to be doing fine and have very mild disease. They also point out if your child has immunocompromised disease like leukemia, the chances of catching COVID-19 rise and the chances of dying from it rise. I think we all kind of know that, I hope. So I just want to go through this one and I will have screenshots up as well. This one was quite interesting and it's been very instrumental. They looked at 138 hospitalized cases of COVID-19 before it was actually called COVID-19 uh, in Wuhan City Hospital. Um, looking from the December outbreak there, which though now we know there were cases in November of 2019 in Wuhan City. So it's a retrospective study. So they went back and they took the cases and went through the case notes and the nursing notes of the first 138, I believe, patients who were admitted to Wuhan City Hospital. So at that time, this was called NCIP, novel corona virus disease, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, at the minute of Zong Hospital in Wuhan City, the University Hospital, between January 1st and the 28th of 2020. And they did some follow-up data on the 3rd of February. So again, this is really early into the outbreak in Wuhan City, and I think it's very important. It's screwed a little bit around because of that. But out of the 138 patients, the average age was 56. Not 60, 70, or 80. Half the patients were 56 years of age or under, and half were over. There is an interesting thing as well, that people say that it's men that get this disease, and men do get this disease more than women. 54% of men compared to, I believe, 45% of women. So a woman has much less chance of getting the disease statistically, but realistically, it's almost 50-50, but it's obviously there's a gender effect. And people are thinking, is it because of smoking? Is it because of this, that, and the other? Nobody's quite sure. And he talks about a whole bunch of different things that go wrong with people and what they looked at. But it's interesting, out of those 138, how many of them died? How many of them went to the ICU? How many of them required hospitalization? 26.1% required ICU care which I think is really interesting. They also gave pretty much all of these patients uh, antibiotics. It seems that when you are very sick with viral pneumonia, COVID-19 disease, bacterial pneumonia comes in on top of that because of the weakening of the body's defenses and also probably dehydration and, not, and bad positioning. So that was interesting. What they gave was, and you won't be able to get some of this for your pets, but some of it you will be able to get. And I kind of don't have a problem with this for a, bacterial pneumonias, they preferentially gave moxifloxacin. You may have a really hard time getting that. Um, they gave ceftriaxone quite a lot, and they gave azithromycin quite a lot, and that's pretty good. They also tended to give steroid therapy, and that would be IV, generally speaking. There's pluses and minuses for putting people on steroid therapy. So if you've got spare steroids from your bodybuilding days, I'm not actually going to recommend you take them. They can reduce the immune system and make you more prone to catch it. And if you catch it and you start taking steroids, I don't think it's worth doing. They tried this uh, in SARS 2003. It didn't help and it made things worse. So I wouldn't go with steroids, but 
they were somewhat desperate. Also, you've got to remember that doctors in the ICU play with patients. Uh, it sounds terrible, but if a patient's outcome is they're on life support and about to die, the idea that you might be able to find a little magic bullet to stop them from dying is what gives pleasure to ICU teams, generally speaking. Now, what happened later on? So this is where we get interesting. Most of the patients, 61% of the patients, developed acute respiratory distress syndrome. I think that's a really interesting way of putting it because we used to call it adult respiratory distress syndrome but with children getting it acute respiratory distress syndrome so 61 percent and that for you in your home is going to be terminal so understand that right now if you are sick in the sick group you may or may not be able to be supported in your home probably you will die if you're transported to the hospital and you're in the sickest group you may or may not die depending on availability of ventilators and trained staff. These people, generally speaking, also developed cardiac arrhythmias, odd beats of the heart. So that's something if you're using the pulse oximeter that Brad from Full Perfection Survival promotes, uh, you might want to actually feel your pulse and if it's not regular, you need to get some medical help. If it's regular and becomes irregular and you've got the other symptoms, you've probably got COVID-19. Not necessarily. A lot of these arrhythmias are actually due to dehydration and we see this in the population normally in emergency departments before a flu spike, a seasonal flu spike, is for two or three days before we'll see a really noticeable increase in tachyarrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, and then we start to see a flu after that, which I think is an interesting one. So let's look at worst case, the ICU population. In generally, they had from their very first symptom they could recall to serious shortness of breath called dyspnea about five days on average. They then were admitted to hospital approximately two days later so from first symptom to hospital admission was about seven days. If you're really short of breath go to hospital don't wait two days is my advice and then they got clinical signs and symptoms of ARDS acute respiratory distress syndrome at day eight. So very soon after hospital admission they got this, but actually they got this about three days after they got the symptomatic. <gasps> I can't breathe very well. Okay. So now we get into the old people. So the ICU group of the 138 had an average age of 66. The age group that did not go to the ICU of the 138 had an age group of 51. So the older tended to be admitted to the ICU because they were sicker. Now we're all epidemiologists and doctors these days, so when I throw a term at you like uh, comorbidities, you know that means you have your disease, but you also have one or two or three or four or five other things wrong with you. So there was a large play on that, and there's still a large play on the comorbidity factor. And certainly the more sicker you are, the more likely you are to die. However, as I have said before, I'll say again, Wuhan City had a very localized outbreak that was hospitalized. They spread the disease all through the hospital because the people that thought there was an issue were not listened to. Surgical floors got it, every floor of the hospital got it. So not surprisingly at the 138 in the first 28 days, a large number of them were actually patients, patients who were already in the hospital. Therefore you would expect to see them being older and with comorbidities. So I'm still not buying this as a general thing. If you are fit and young and healthy and you catch COVID-19 disease, you will be ill enough to be picked up and hospitalized for most people out of one in 200. That's significant. This isn't like, this won't affect children, this won't affect young adults, this won't affect middle-aged men, I'm 56, I'm fine. No, don't get it. You also, if you catch it, you can pass it on to others who might be older and then they might get ventilators. So that's the issue. Uh, it's not a disease of the elderly. It's a disease that kills the elderly statistically quite higher. It's a disease that kills males statistically quite higher than females, but not that much. Not certainly as much as is being portrayed by certain aspects of the media. And certainly Italy's been very clear on this. They are seeing younger and younger patients. And that's to be expected. How it spreads, it spread through air travel. People who are young don't really travel much. They don't have much money, generally speaking. It's the elderly, the richer people. Who goes on cruises? Not me. It's the very elderly, right? Um, 
that's where the disease started two to three to four weeks later it expresses its for itself as dyspnea then they go to hospital and they get treated and then around about 26 percent of them in the initial cases needed to go to the icu or die so out of the patients who were actually in wuhan city hospitals Zonga hospital who actually were originally patients there for other things and then call it from the nursing staff and patients, but mostly from the nursing staff transmitting it, they actually had a mortality of 4.3%. Bearing in mind, this is looking from the 1st of January to the 3rd of February. I'm pretty sure some of them died after that. So this was the data we were given and, and I was happy. This was obviously published after my warning on the 26th of January. This was not something that was gonna go away and was serious. This, until for me, to the 26th of January looked like SARS 2003. It's going to spread very widely, it's going to kill a tiny percentage compared to SARS, and it was going to be mainly gathered up easily in the community and put into hospitals. That's what I saw until the 26th. By the 26th of January, just because of the case explosion and where the cases were, it was obvious to a dead man that it was airborne or being transmitted very easily. Now they're still claiming it's not really airborne, but the case transmission is round about two and a half times to three times more infectious than seasonal flu. So think about the last time you actually had real flu, you know, real flu, you lie on your back, you think you're gonna die, a cold, you wander around moaning, right? You're not at the end, you to wander around with flu. Think about how fast I travel through your house, through your work, through your office, through your school. This is infectious three times more than that. So because it's a retrospective study, they didn't have to be alive, and they didn't have to examine them, they could just pull the cases and read the case notes, and this was cool. So uh, table one, which I'm going to put up, this actually shows the median ages of the different groups and it also shows you the gender breakdown and you can see that the percentages are actually within the initial exposure in the hopeful market. And you can see who got it and you can see what comorbidities they had and you can also see the signs and symptoms. So the signs and symptoms really for me break up into three groups. The first group is fever, fatigue and dry cough. Fever, fatigue, and dry cough are gonna be the most common symptoms you're gonna get, but you may not have any of them. The next three are gonna be anorexia, malaysia, and dyspnea. So that is for those people who don't like lingo, you're not hungry, all of your muscles ache, and you uh, short breath, at rest. The next four big ones, uh, expectation, pharyngea, diarrhea, and nausea. So that's, for those other people who don't speak science, coughing up phlegm. Now, in this case, that would indicate bacterial pneumonia. You're probably not gonna cough up any phlegm. If you just have viral pneumonia and COVID-19 disease, it's from SARS-CoV-2, and that is a viral pneumonia. But a lot of these people got bacterial pneumonia really easily. Pharyngia, which I've never used that term ever in my life, and I don't know why anybody would, means you have a sore throat. The other one is diarrhea. Now diarrhea is interesting because diarrhea hit about 10% of the population group. And in the ICU, it was actually there in 16% of them. So about 7% non-ICU. So you're going to see diarrhea in a significant number of people with COVID-19 disease. So you need to have lots of wet wipes. You need to have strong pads for the bed, maybe with plastic on the bed sheets. And you need to have a plan to wash people in bed if they've had diarrhea because approximately one in 20 people with COVID-19 are gonna have diarrhea. I think it's significant, especially because it's pretty certain now in March 14th that you can infect yourself from diarrhea. Nausea is an interesting one. So nausea, nausea is basically the same for both groups, slightly higher in the ICU group. So that's about one in 10. So what you need to do is you need to have your anti-emetics, you need to have your anti-nausea medications. Now, I know a lot of people have those, but if you give too much, put them to sleep, they won't cough, they'll get pneumonia, they'll die. So it's gonna be a balance. But I've shown it before and I'll say it again, get suppositories for anti-nausea and anti-vomiting medications because you can't rely on swallowing them. And it's very easy to put a suppository up there and it'll have the same effect. Once you're not able to swallow because your throat's sore and you're nauseated and you're anorexic, that's the death spiral, in my opinion, to what will happen to people in their own homes if they cannot get an ambulance to take them to hospital because the hospital's shut or there's no ambulances or there's nobody there with them. That's the death spiral. That's why I keep saying take Tylenol and aspirin. They recommend Tylenol and ibuprofen, whatever, but take 
two if you're safely able to. One to two tablets of each every four hours, but take them over a two hour period. First hour you take Tylenol, next hour take nothing, next hour take aspirin or Advil, next hour take nothing, next hour repeat the Tylenol dose, so the Tylenol dose is four hours apart. Get that temperature down, keep hydration, keep drinking Gatorade or Lucozade or any sports drink you can get. Yes, you can go to a chemist or a pharmacist and buy very expensive oral rehydrating tablet powders. I don't see why you need to. You can also very simply make sugar and salt solution and drink that. Be careful with this though. You don't want to really overdo it. And the thing with Gatorade and stuff like that, if you actually drink too much of it, you just don't want to drink any more. But you can assess for hydration by testing out various parts of the human body. And we'll get into that as this disease continues. This was a Bad Terrier 2020 production.